Hi, I'm Conrad, and you're watching Western Adventures. Today, I'm going to tell you everything I've learned about how to build an off-grid electrical system. First, I'm going to explain what all the components do, and then I'm going to tell you how I built my 600-watt solar system for under $400. All off-grid electrical systems are going to need three main things. You need your input, your storage, and your output. Now, your storage is going to be some form of a battery bank. Now this battery bank is going to store DC power, so that means the electrons in your circuit are going to run from the negative to the positive. Now in order to run any DC system, you're going to need some sort of fuse box in order to protect from short circuiting. Uh, now if you have anything that plugs in like this, uh, you're going to need some way to convert this DC power to AC power. AC power alternates the current flow and the voltage uh, from positive to negative, uh, at least here in the United States, 60 times per second. Elsewhere, it's 50 hertz, but um, I'll just focus on the U.S. for here. Anyway, you are going to need some form of an inverter to change your DC to AC power in order to run household appliances. Now, that takes care of your output, but what about your input? you got all sorts of options. I'm only going to cover three here. One, you have solar panels as an option. Now, if you're going to run solar panels, you're going to need some form of a charge controller in order to actually power your battery bank. Now, another option that's particularly good in vehicles is a battery isolator. Now, this takes power from the uh, car battery uh, through a, a little circuit protector here. There's several types, so I'm not going to go into the explanation right now. But it basically charges your house battery bank off of your vehicle battery. And the last option is a generator which is just a, an engine that runs an electricity generator and puts out AC power at the other end. Now, we've got a lot to cover here, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is the inverter. An inverter takes the DC power from your battery bank and turns it into AC power to run household appliances. There are two types of inverters, a pure sine wave inverter and a modified sine wave inverter. A pure sine wave inverter mimics grid power by putting out a smooth sine wave transition between positive and negative voltage peaks. You can run any AC appliance off this type of inverter so long as you don't exceed its maximum power output. A modified sine wave inverter puts out a square wave transition between positive and negative voltage. This choppy transition will cause some sensitive circuits to function incorrectly or to not function at all. The square wave also delivers more power that appliances are designed to use, causing appliances to run hotter and less efficiently. So why would anyone use a modified sine wave inverter? Well, they are much simpler to make, and consequently, they are around one-fifth of the cost of a pure sine wave inverter. Furthermore, they will run most things just fine. For our inverter, we've opted to go for a modified sine wave 3000 watt inverter from China. It's a cheap, no-brand uh, inverter, and I think it puts out a little less than it's rated for, but it's worked consistently since we moved in here, and the thing cost about $60 brand new. Now the next thing we're going to talk about is the battery bank. Getting the right battery bank is crucial to your electrical system's operation. So let's dive into it. There are three relevant battery types I'm going to talk about. Flooded lead acid batteries, AGM batteries, and lithium batteries. Flooded lead acid batteries are the oldest and cheapest option here. GC2 lead acid golf cart batteries which are often used to power the 12 volt systems in trailers and RVs, can be found for about $100 new. When properly maintained, they can last 6 to 10 years. That said, these are the only batteries on this list that require periodic maintenance. During the charging cycle, these batteries consume a small amount of the water in their cells and release hydrogen into the surrounding area. This has two implications. First, the battery cells need to be refilled with distilled water every 2 to 4 weeks, and second, these batteries cannot be mounted inside the vehicle unless they are in a sealed compartment directly vented to the outside. If this sounds like too much of a hassle, you might be more interested in AGM batteries. AGM batteries cost two and a half to three times more than flooded lead acid batteries, but they require no maintenance. They are also significantly lighter than flooded lead acid batteries, and they do not emit any gases. They typically last from three to five years, depending on how deeply they are discharged in each cycle. Both flooded lead acid batteries and AGM batteries last the longest when they are only discharged to about 50% capacity, and the battery voltage drops linearly for most of the discharge. Lithium batteries, on the other hand, 
have a built-in battery management system that safely allow them to be discharged to their full rated capacity without damaging the battery, and they maintain most of their voltage throughout the discharge. This means you can replace a lead-acid battery bank with a lithium one containing just over half the prior capacity. This helps to offset the fact that lithium batteries cost 8 to 10 times more than our flooded lead-acid counterparts. Lithium batteries are significantly lighter than AGM, and they can last over 10 years. Regardless of what battery type you go with, you're going to need to size it properly. You can calculate all of your energy requirements and come to an exact battery capacity required, but I would recommend oversizing your battery bank and charging options to account for extra electricity use that you may need. For our battery bank, we've opted to go with four GC2 golf cart batteries. Now these are flooded lead acid batteries and we mounted them under the chassis so that they could release hydrogen as part of their charging cycle without releasing hydrogen into the cab. Now these batteries we bought second hand for $35 a piece. So that makes our total battery bank uh, cost $140 and it's 460 amp hours of capacity. The next thing we're going to talk about is the charging options. Now the three that I'm going to talk about are the battery isolator, the generator, and the solar system. This is a battery isolator. Now there's many different types, but the one I'm talking about today is a voltage sensitive relay. This thing works by detecting the voltage of the vehicle battery in order to determine if the engine's running. If it determines that the engine is running, it closes this solenoid to connect these two wires in order to transfer power from the vehicle alternator through this wire into this wire that goes back to the house battery bank, charging it. Now, this is a very cost-effective means of charging your house battery, as this thing only costs around $20 and is extremely reliable. Uh, if you travel all the time and uh, don't spend any time, you know, sitting around for days on end, this can be a cost-effective means of running your entire vehicle's electrical system. Now, the next form of power generation that I want to talk about is a straight-up generator. Now, these are when you have a gas or a diesel engine that directly turns a generator to generate AC power. These can be used to directly power your AC appliances uh, and your whole AC system on the inside, uh, and they can also be used to charge your battery bank. Now, we have a 3,000 watt generator mounted under our chassis. Um, however, I haven't actually hooked it up to our AC uh, power system or anything really, because the only reason I mounted this was to run our welder. Now, the next form of power generation we're gonna talk about is the solar system. So for that, we're gonna to need to go up to the roof. This is our solar system. Now, there's two types of solar panels that are relevant to van and bus conversions uh, that are worth talking about. These are 36 volt panels. They normally go on houses. Uh, and the other type that's worth noting is 12 volt panels as they are more easily connected to a 12 volt electrical system. Now, I have chosen to go with 36 volt panels because they put out more power uh, and I found that it is cheaper to get a uh, high power solar system with this type of panel. Now, these panels I bought second hand. They were four years old when I purchased them and I bought them for $59 each. Now, in order to run this type of panel, we need to talk about charge controllers. So, come with me inside. There's two types of solar charge controllers. Pulse width modulation and maximum power point tracking, or MPPT. Pulse width modulation charge controllers are the cheaper option and they work great when the solar input voltage is just over the battery bank voltage. These charge controllers can be found new for under $50, but they have their limitations. When compared to MPPT charge controllers, they are inefficient at stepping down the input voltage, and they don't work as well in cloudy weather or in partial shade. MPPT charge controllers work like an adjustable DC to DC step down transformer. They sense the input voltage and efficiently drop it to the required charge voltage, adjusting at center intervals constantly. These controllers allow multiple panels to be hooked up in series as long as they don't exceed the maximum input voltage. They are more expensive than pulse width modulation, but in the right application can make the whole solar system cheaper. There's two things to consider when planning your solar system, battery bank voltage and input solar power. Most people will want to run a 12 volt battery bank in order to maximize the availability of DC powered products that will work with it. If you run a 12 volt battery bank and a pulse width modulation charge controller, you will need to run 12 volt solar panels. 
These typically put out around 75 to 150 watts and are rare to find secondhand due to their relatively low production numbers. Given the fact that you'll need to run new solar panels with a pulse width modulation controller, this is only the most cost effective system under around 250 watts. If you want to run between 250 and 1000 watts, the most cost effective layout will be an MPPT charge controller with one or more 36 volt solar panels. 36 volt solar panels are mass produced for use on houses and buildings and consequently can be found used for $100 or less. They typically put out around 250 to 500 watts and last over 20 years. Now at this point we need to look at how charge controllers are sized. MPPT charge controllers are designed for a maximum input voltage and a maximum output current. The input voltage limit will restrict how many panels you can connect in series, while the output current limit will restrict the total power capability of your system. If you want to run more than 1000 watts of solar power, you will save money on your charge controller by running a higher voltage battery bank. This is because power is equal to the current times the voltage. If you increase the voltage without changing the current, the power will increase equally. This means that a charge controller can run four times more power with a 48 volt battery bank than with a 12 volt one. Considering this, it makes sense why most off-grid cabins run 48 volt or higher battery banks, but this isn't the whole picture. While running a higher battery voltage will save money on the charge controller, it will limit the compatibility of DC appliances and therefore require a larger and more expensive inverter to use effectively. For our system, I've opted to go with a Renogy Rover 40 amp MPPT charge controller. This I bought second hand on Craigslist for $50 and it has been working fantastically ever since I installed it. So that concludes our electrical system video. Now I know there's a whole lot of information to unpack there, so I want to just break down what we did for our system one last time in a concise manner. So our battery bank, we paid $140 for four GC2 batteries. Our charge controller we paid $50 for, so that brings the total up to $190. Our solar panels we paid $120 for the two of them, so added to $190, that's uh, $210, $310. Uh, and our inverter we paid $75 for, so that brings the total up to $395, if I'm not mistaken, $385. Just under $400 for a 600 watt solar system. So, thanks for watching. I hope you uh, learned something. If uh, you have any further questions or need to correct me on something that I was factually incorrect on, please let me know in the comments. Otherwise, like, subscribe, and have a good day.